This is the Music History In-Depth Podcast for July 31st to August 6th. On this week's show, MTV debuts and influences pop culture, Pearl Jam drops an iconic music video, and Hamilton takes its shot. This show goes more in depth about some of the events that we put on our daily podcast, the Music History Today podcast, which drops every single day, including weekends, wherever you get your podcast from. Now, on to this week's episode. On August 1st, 1981, an event happened that changed and defined music for the next 20 years or so. That was when MTV debuted. There had been attempts at music video channels before. There was, for instance, a channel called The Now Explosion in Atlanta back in 1970. Some record stores had a music video promotional channel piped into their stores called Music Video TV. Shows like Soul Train, Top of the Pops, and American Bandstand occasionally used music videos during their shows. Plus, there was Don Kirshner's Rock Concert and also the Midnight Special, which used music videos and concert footage, as did the Ed Sullivan television show that was on every Sunday night on CBS television. However, there was a guy named Robert Pittman, who at the time was a media executive at Warner American Express Satellite Entertainment Company, which later became known as MTV Networks, who decided to give the idea of a video version of a radio station a national rollout, mainly because teenagers were being ignored by corporate media and thus was a completely untapped market with lots of disposable income, That last part being the most important part. Pittman tried the idea on WNBC television in New York City with a 15-minute show called Animal Tracks and based it on a show in New Zealand at the time called Radio with Channels. His boss, John Lack, also had experience with this concept, having helped to run a show from Michael Nesmith, formerly of the group The Monkees, called Pop Clips, which was based on that sort of format. They decided to give this new national show and channel a rollout, and at 12.01 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on August 1st, 1981, MTV debuted. The long opening was of a space shuttle countdown, followed by the shuttle taking off, and a photo of Neil Armstrong holding an MTV flag, followed by an animated MTV logo. Now, just for the record, for those of you not in the know, Neil Armstrong did not fly on the space shuttle. The space shuttle was an 80s version of a spaceship. Neil Armstrong was back in the late 60s, and he was on a Saturn V rocket. Anywho... A 30-second version of this opening, sometimes with a Saturn V rocket, to make it a little bit more historically relevant, I guess, ran at the top of every hour with the video jockeys, or VJs, talking over the clip, telling you what was coming up in that particular hour. Fun fact about this opening, by the way, the first words said on the network were said during the original opening. They were, quote, ladies and gentlemen, rock and roll, end quote. They were said by John Lack. The space shuttle part of the opening was discontinued in 1986 due to the January 28th, 1986 space shuttle Challenger disaster. The MTV theme song that ran in the background was written by Jonathan Elias and John Peterson. The first video that was played on the channel was the prophetic Video Killed the Radio Star by the group The Buggles. The first female singer on the channel was also the second music video played overall on the channel. That was Pat Benatar with the song You Better Run. The first male solo artist was Rod Stewart with the third video that was played She Won't Dance With Me. The rest of the first 10 videos played were Little Susie's on the Top by Ph.D., We Don't Talk Anymore by Cliff Richard, Brass and Pocket by The Pretenders, 
Time Heals by Todd Rundgren, REO Speedwagon's Taken on the Run, and Styx's Rockin' the Paradise. The first VJ shown on the channel was Mark Goodman, who now does an 80s streaming station on Sirius XM Satellite Radio. There were five original MTV VJs, along with Mark Goodman. There was J.J. Jackson, Nina Blackwood, Martha Quinn, and Alan Hunter. There were a few problems with the channel at first. The first, and the biggest at the time, was distribution. Not many people had cable. In fact, my neighborhood in Springfield, Massachusetts, where I grew up, didn't even get cable until 1983. The second was that there were extremely few minority artists being played on the channel. More on that in a little while. The third was that there weren't that many artists making music videos, at least not many American pop and rock artists unless they were doing concert videos. To be sure, music videos had been around for decades. I mean, Bob Dylan and the Beatles made them. And who could forget Queens' iconic music video for Bohemian Rhapsody, which has now earned the distinction of being its own meme. R&B artists were making music videos, but MTV wasn't playing any of those. Like I said, we'll get to that later. Instead, MTV started playing British artists who had been making music videos for years due to the TV show that had been on for over 40 years, Top of the Pops. Since that was all that MTV wanted to play, they played them pretty much nonstop. Thing was, people liked what they heard. And then, of course, they went to the record stores to buy the singles and the albums, and that in turn made record labels get radio stations to play that music, and that is how the new wave music became a thing, in America at least, after being a thing over in Great Britain. What was the influence of MTV? Well, for starters, videos did kill the radio star. Before, it really didn't matter what you looked like because people were hearing your music. After that, image became everything. A lot of bands became roadkill in the video era with lots of bands who never, ever would have made it big becoming huge stars. Also, MTV became appointment television. World music video premieres became a thing. People had to rush home to catch the latest music video from their favorite artists. Remember, kids, this was long before the internet became big, or anything at that point. If you missed something on television, then you completely missed it, unless you either had a VCR and could run it nonstop, if you had cool parents at least, or you had to sit there and wait for the music video so you could tape it and watch it again later, if you didn't have cool parents, and I'm not going to say which ones I had, but let's just say I had to sit there an awfully long time. Anyway, not that I'm bitter, MTV also pushed genres like New Wave, and as we'll see later, hip-hop and grunge rock, although they were really late to the hip-hop party, but at least they got there. They were also late to the R&B and dance craze in the late 1980s and early 1990s because they didn't play those videos. Again, we'll get to that later. Their influence also didn't end with record sales. It affected television in general. MTV spawned a host of copycats, most noticeably a show called Friday Night Videos on NBC, which used to run after The Tonight Show on Friday evenings. There was their own spin-off channel, VH1, which helped to push adult contemporary and new age music in the 1990s. That also led to Michael Bolton and Kenny G having careers. There was Canada's version of MTV called Much Music, along with American channel Fuse. MTV also caused the head of NBC television at the time, Brandon Tartikoff, to famously write on a napkin at a restaurant during a pitch session with a producer that for his next show, he wanted, quote, MTV cops, end quote. That idea for the show became the trend-setting 80s cop show Miami Vice. We'll discuss that show in the September episode when we talk about when the show actually premiered. 
One thing that MTV does not get enough credit for is that it inspired an entire generation of kids to get into videography and editing, and in the process turned music videos into an art form. They also got artists to step up their game, turning some videos, in some cases, into mini-movies. Case in point, Michael Jackson's Thriller video. MTV also had hit shows of their own. There was a game show called Remote Control, which had Ken Ober, Colin Quinn, and Kari Wurr, and also was one of Adam Sandler's first shows. There was a dance show called Club MTV with downtown Julie Brown. Wubba, wubba, wubba. Goodbye. God bless. Fun fact. Before Camille Grammer was on one of those Real Housewives shows as Kelsey Grammer's ex-wife. I think that was the Beverly Hills one. I don't know. I don't watch that stuff. Anyway, before then, she danced on Club MTV. It's kind of how she got famous. There was a dating game show called Singled Out, which was hosted by a pre-nerdist and G4 TV Attack of the Show host, Chris Hardwick, who was also a VJ back in the day. That show also made stars out of his co-hosts, Jenny McCarthy and Carmen Electra. There was MTV Unplugged, which actually started out as an idea after John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora did an acoustic version of their song Dead or Alive during an MTV Video Music Award ceremony because producers needed to fill a few minutes of dead air during the ceremony. The response to it was so good that they turned this idea into a show. It started out kind of slow at first, and then... Paul McCartney did the show and released it as a quote-unquote bootleg album. After that, everybody wanted to do the show. It rejuvenated Mariah Carey's career at that time and yielded numerous hit albums and even got Tony Bennett and Eric Clapton Album of the Year Grammys. There was Headbangers Ball with host Ricky Rockman, which showed heavy metal videos. There was the late-night alternative rock show 120 Minutes with host Matt Penfield, which introduced the mainstream to goth and alternative artists like The Cure. There was also The Real World, which jump-started the latest wave of reality television. And, of course, who can forget Jersey Shore? Or even Total Request Live, its countdown show starring Carson Daly, who is now on the Today Show on NBC television. I'm not actually sure what MTV shows now, aside from maybe Teen Wolf and Catfish, if they're even still on. I don't think they are. The channel, which also gave us the show Punked, became irrelevant once they decided to shift as far away from music as humanly possible. I get that YouTube, Vivo, and Spotify changed the dynamics and people weren't actually going to wait around to watch the latest music videos and that the internet basically made it on demand and whatever. It's all good. However, they could have at least stayed relevant with music documentaries, TV shows, movies, interview shows, anything really, at least as long as it was music related. Maybe their new owners, now that they've been sold, will care enough to get MTV back to being something other than where they do a couple award shows for things they don't show, because right now, they're just kind of there. However, back in the day, MTV was on the cutting edge of pop culture, and MTV's reign as kingmakers of music and pop culture all started on August 1st, 1981. As an added bonus, by the way, even though British music helped to propel MTV in the early 1980s, there still was no MTV in Europe. That all changed on August 1st, 1987, when MTV Europe premiered. First video played? Appropriately, it was Dire Straits with Money for Nothing, about a guy watching and commenting on music videos. It also had Sting singing the MTV advertising slogan in the chorus, I want my MTV. Next, back in the early 1980s, MTV had a bit of a racial problem. Because they considered themselves a rock format channel, 
they rarely ever played any R&B or dance videos. That also meant that for the most part, they didn't play any videos with minorities in them. It's not to say that there weren't videos or artists available to them, like Tina Turner, even before What's Love Got to Do With It. The group The Specials were the 74th video played on the channel, but they were a racially mixed band. Plus, they played ska music, which was well within MTV's wheelhouse at the time. There were 209 videos that were played that first day, and the only black people they showed were the three black guys in the specials and VJ JJ Jackson. Rest in peace, JJ. I mean, if MTV considered themselves a rock music video channel, then they should have just called themselves RMTV. It would have worked. The rock format excuse was just MTV's excuse at the time, even though they were desperate for music videos at that point. For example, on that first day, Phil Collins' classic song, In the Air Tonight, was played five times, along with April Wine and The Who, while Iron Maiden were played four times, along with The Pretenders, Tom Petty, Stevie Nicks, and Rockpile with Robert Plant. Even Mark Goodman gave the Rock Music Channel excuse to David Bowie during an interview that famously reappeared online and started making the rounds when David Bowie passed away. I'll put a link to that exchange between the two of them in the show notes if you want to check it out. David was not buying Mark Goodman's excuse one single bit. It was kind of a nice little beatdown. This whole thing changed in 1983 when CBS Records president Walter Yetnikoff made MTV an offer. Actually, he made a threat. See, he had this artist named Michael Jackson who had been trying to get his music videos played on the channel for years. As a matter of fact, Michael had been making music videos for years, both as a solo artist and with his brothers, the Jacksons. If he didn't get the music videos played... Yetnikoff would pull every single music video from every single artist that CBS had on the channel. Back then, CBS Records was one of the biggest, if not the biggest, record label out there. And they had an awful lot of artists on that channel. MTV relented, and they started playing the song Billie Jean, but only after it had hit number one on the Billboard Singles Chart. Then, Michael Jackson released the song Beat It, with a now classic music video to go along with it. Both he and MTV got a lot of exposure. In fact, it is often said that Michael Jackson made MTV, and MTV made Michael Jackson. I would say that statement is pretty accurate. It was a pretty symbiotic relationship. Still, Even though they started putting on black artists, for the most part, they stayed away from one genre of music that was trying to get huge at the time, hip-hop. They started to play some rap videos from artists like the Beastie Boys and Run DMC, but for the most part, rap was shown on extremely light rotation, which is to say, maybe once a day if your names weren't the Beastie Boys or Run DMC. This began to change in 1987. Filmmaker Jonathan Demme's nephew, director Ted Demme, was in 1987 a fledgling production assistant for MTV. He and his partner Peter Doherty approached MTV with an idea. How about a rap show with interviews and music videos? MTV said sure, but don't put it on MTV in America where rap was getting more popular. Put it on MTV Europe, because uh, I have no idea. I figure it was their version of doing the old foghorn leghorn. Go away, kid. You're bothering me now. Go play with your little TV show over there, because we only gave it to you because your uncle is kind of a big deal in this town. Funny thing was that little show of theirs got popular in Europe. And after it found some success overseas, MTV had no choice but to bring it stateside, and Demi and Doherty were given the green light to do that in America. 
The original American episode aired on August 6th, 1988. The original host was rapper Fab Five Freddy, who was already a well-known name to hip-hop along with Blondie fans when he was name-checked in the rap on Blondie's song Rapture, also appeared in the music video. Afterwards, MTV developed a daily and weekend edition. Fab Five Freddy hosted the weekend edition. For the weekday edition, Demi turned to Dr. Dre, not the Dr. Dre of NWA fame, but famous DJ Dr. Dre, and Ed Lover, who was a friend of Demi's from high school. The show became a huge hit, ran for seven years, and spawned copycats like Rap City and Sucker Free. Most importantly, it helped to push hip-hop more into the mainstream, due to the fact that by then, MTV had established itself into more homes and more countries. And it all started when the show, Yo! MTV Raps, was broadcasted on MTV in America on August 6th, 1988. Before we go any further, we'd like to tell you about our other podcast. The Music History Today podcast goes over the daily events in music history and drops daily, including weekends, on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. There's also the Music Halls of Fame podcast, which talks about a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with other Music Halls of Fame's museums and walks of fame. The Music Halls of Fame podcast drops every Thursday and can also be found on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Now, back to this podcast. Since we're on the subject of MTV, let's discuss an iconic music video that premiered on This Week in Music History. On the morning of January 8th, 1991, 15-year-old high school sophomore Jeremy Wade Dell walked into his second period English class at Richardson High School, which is in the Richardson Independent School District in Richardson, Texas. Jeremy was known for being a bit of a loner. His classmates said that he was quiet, always kept to himself, always kind of sad. On that particular morning, Jeremy was late for school. When he walked into class, he was told to go to the headmaster's office, known in most schools as the principal's office, in order to fill out paperwork for being late. Ah, the good old-fashioned tardy slip. He left then came back a few minutes later. He walked to the front of the class of 30 students and said to the teacher, quote, Miss, I got what I really went for, end quote. In his hand was a three fifty seven Magnum handgun. Jeremy raised the handgun to his mouth and in front of his stunned classmates and teacher before anyone could do anything about it, Jeremy pulled the trigger killing himself in front of his classmates and his teacher. The incident drew local attention, but not a lot of national attention, except for a small article in a newspaper. One person read that article and decided to draw attention to Jeremy's pain and reasoning for his suicide. As this person said in an interview in 1993, quote, It came from a small paragraph in a paper, which means you kill yourself and you make a big old sacrifice and try to get your revenge. That all you're going to end up with is a paragraph in a newspaper. 64 degrees and cloudy in a suburban neighborhood. That's the beginning of the video, and that's the same thing in the end. It does nothing. Nothing changes. The world goes on and you're gone. The best revenge is to live on and prove yourself. Be stronger than those people. End quote. Sixteen years after that interview, that same person said that he felt, quote, the need to take that small article and make something of it, to give that action, to give it reaction, to give it more importance. End quote. That person was Eddie Vedder, 
and he would not only give Jeremy that importance, but through a song, and especially through a music video, Jeremy would help Eddie's band Pearl Jam become huge. Pearl Jam rose from the ashes of a few different bands. Guitarist Stone Gossard and bassist Jeff Ament were in a small Seattle band known as Green River. Once Stone and Jeff left Green River, they started the group Mother Love Bone with lead singer Andrew Wood, who used to be in the band Malfunction. Mother Love Bone got a record deal, recorded the album Apple, and were well on their way to stardom when Andrew died from a heroin overdose also killing Mother Lovebone in the process. After a few months of grieving his good friend Andrew, Stone started playing with guitarist Mike McCready after Mike's band Shadow had broken up. Bad year for band breakups, apparently. They then got Jeff to join their new band. The first drummer that they tried to get for this band was Jack Irons, who at the time played with the Red Hot Chili Peppers. They gave Jack a demo tape to gauge his interest. Jack said no to the offer. However, he knew a singer who might be interested in joining. Jack gave the tape to this guy, Eddie Vedder, who was in the band Bad Radio. Eddie listened to the tape, penned some lyrics to the songs, and sent the tape back. The guys were pretty impressed and got Eddie to come up to Seattle from San Diego, where Eddie was at, in order to do an audition. Eddie was hired the next week. They then found their original drummer, Dave Krusen, named themselves after basketball player Mookie Blaylock, and started playing gigs until they got a record deal with Epic Records in 1991. At that point, they renamed themselves Pearl Jam. The group stepped into London Bridge Studios with producer Rick Parishar in early 1991 to record their debut album, 10, which happened to be Mookie Blaylock's basketball jersey number, just for the record. In the span of five months, they went through three drummers. As a matter of fact, being a drummer in Pearl Jam was a lot like being a drummer in Spinal Tap, which really means that for one reason or another, you weren't going to last that long. Dave Krusen left and checked himself into a rehab clinic for alcoholism. His replacement, Matt Chamberlain, lasted a couple of months. He's the drummer that you see in the music video for the song Alive, since the video was footage from a concert that the group held on August 3, 1991, at the Seattle venue Rock Candy. Matt left a couple months later to join the Saturday Night Live band and was replaced by Dave Abruzzi. It was in this environment that the song Jeremy was born. Jeremy is actually about two kids, not one. Jeremy, who we already talked about, and a kid named Brian, who did a school shooting in San Diego, California. Brian is who Eddie's talking about in the second part of the song where he starts with, quote, clearly I remember picking on the boy, end quote. As Eddie said in an interview in 1991, quote, I actually knew somebody in junior high school in San Diego, California that did the same thing just about, didn't take his life, but ended up shooting up an oceanography room. I remember being in the halls and hearing it, and I had actually had altercations with this kid in the past. I was kind of a rebellious fifth grader, and I think we got in fights and stuff. So it's a bit about this kid named Jeremy, and it's also a bit about a kid named Brian that I knew and I don't know. The song, I think it says a lot. I think it goes somewhere. And a lot of people interpret it in different ways. And it's just been recently that I've been talking about the true meaning behind it. And I hope no one's offended. And believe me, I think of Jeremy when I sing it. End quote. Eddie was the sole lyricist on the song while Jeff Ament did the music. Jeff said in an interview, quote, I already had two pieces of music that I wrote on acoustic guitar with the idea that I would play them on a Hamer 12-string bass I had just ordered. When the bass arrived, one of the pieces became Jeremy. 
I had an idea for the outro while we were recording it the second time. I overdubbed a 12-string bass and we added a cello. That was big-time production for us. Rick Parshar's a super-talented engineer musician. Stone Gossard was sick one day, and Ed, Rick, and I conjured up the art piece that opens and closes the song. That was so fun. I wanted to make a whole record like that. We knew it was a good song, but it was tough getting it to feel right, for the chorus to sit back and the outro to push over the top. The tune went from practically not making it on the record to being one of the best takes. I'm not sure if it's the best song on the album, but I think it's the best take. On Jeremy, I always heard this other melody in the choruses in in the end, and it never sounded good on guitar or bass. So we brought in a cello player, which inspired a background vocal, and all those things made the song really happen. Most of the time, if something doesn't work right away, I just say fuck it. But this was an instance where perseverance paid off. End quote. While the album 10 was released in 1991, the album was not a huge hit right out the gate. Their debut single, Alive, got noticed on MTV and did okay. Same with their second single, Even Flow. In 1992, they did an American tour. I actually went to see the band on April 7, 1992 at the Student Union Ballroom at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, Massachusetts, as I was running the local Musicland record store at that time and had gotten free tickets. Tickets for the concert, by the way, were $8 for students and $10 for the general public. Yes, $10 to go see Pearl Jam in 1992, mind you. Number of people, by the way, who were at that concert, less than 400. By the end of the summer of 1992, Pearl Jam were done playing $10 gigs in front of 400 people at colleges. And that was mainly because of a music video. There were two music videos made for the song Jeremy. The first one was made by photographer Chris Cafaro, who Eddie had met and insisted to the record label that he make a video for the band. The label said in 1991 that he could make one for any song he wanted to. So, Chris chose Jeremy. The problem was that originally, Jeremy was never supposed to be released as a single. The record label didn't believe in it. Chris still wanted to make it, so the label said, all right, fine. But they weren't going to pay for it. Chris took money out of his own pocket, got a loan, sold a bunch of his furniture, then found an actor named Eric Schubert and made the music video in a warehouse on Pico Boulevard in Los Angeles, California. He had a spinning platform that the crew spun where he had each band member stand on one at a time while filming. Eddie made a mourning band out of a black gaffer tape for this scene, wrapped it around his arm. The shoot was done. The label saw the video, said thanks, and didn't release it, of course. It must be out there somewhere, probably on their music video channel, actually. I hope someone reimbursed Chris for all of his troubles and especially all that money that he coughed up. Anyway... 1992 came around. The album was doing okay, but it wasn't knocking it out of the park at that point. Grunge was not huge, let's say. It was percolating. The label had released two songs and needed to release another one, and suddenly Jeremy was looking like it might be a good single to release. They needed another music video for it because they hated the first one, so they started from scratch. They got music video director Mark Pellington, who was not a Pearl Jam fan, but connected with Eddie through his passion for the song. In June of 1992, the band went to a studio in King's Cross, London, England, to shoot the band shots. For you Gen Z and millennials out there, yes, that's the area where Harry Potter left for Hogwarts in the first book, track 
whatever it was, nine and a half, two and a half, I don't know. Sorry. Potter was a little after my time, kids. What can I tell you? Anyway, Pellington decided that unlike the original video version, he wanted to focus on Eddie as the narrator of the song, which is why you mainly see Eddie in the video with the other guys interspersed throughout. Pellington also used a lot of quick edits in the video in order to make it feel like it was more of a collage. The band at first did not like the concept for the video because they really wanted to do another concert video like they did for Alive and Evenflow. In retrospect, though, according to Jeff Ament, the rest of the band should have actually just been left out of the video because it would have worked better with only Eddie as the main focus. The classroom scenes were shot at Bayonne High School in Bayonne, New Jersey. Jeremy was played this time by 12-year-old Trevor Wilson in his one and only acting role. In case you're about to do a Google search for whatever happened to Trevor Wilson, I'll save you the trouble because it's not a good ending. Trevor Wilson drowned in Puerto Rico while on vacation while swimming in 2016 at the age of 36. Rest in peace, Trevor. The music video for Jeremy premiered on MTV on August 1st, 1992. It very quickly struck a nerve with everyone and was put into heavy rotation, which is MTV speak for it was played almost every hour, almost every other hour in some cases. When the song came out a couple weeks later on August 17, 1992, the song quickly rose up on the American rock music charts, making it to number five. On the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart, though, it only made it to number 79. The song, and especially the music video, quickly turned Pearl Jam into rock stars. With Nirvana hitting the mainstream first with Smells Like Teen Spirit and, of course, their album Nevermind, both Nirvana and Pearl Jam ushered in the Seattle sound, more commonly referred to as the grunge rock era, and it helped to crush the hairband era of rock music. Other Seattle groups started breaking through, most notably Soundgarden and Alice in Chains, and soon, Record labels descended upon Seattle, trying to find the next hot grunge band. The old joke was that in Seattle, you could get a band together on Monday and have a record deal by Friday. Sometimes that was actually literally. Coincidentally, a movie was filming in Seattle just before the Seattle sound got huge, and the movie was about, among other things, the Seattle music scene. It was the Cameron Crowe movie Singles, which also had a completely unknown Pearl Jam at the time in a few scenes as actor Matt Dillon's backup band. Singles also helped to push grunge into the mainstream, and it also had a killer soundtrack. Then there was, of course, the commercialization of grunge music and fashion with fashion designers like Tommy Hilfiger selling $200 lumberjack shirts that normally went for less than $20 in your local department store, but we'll save those stories for another day. The music video itself was not without controversy. The original edit for the video had the gun going to Jeremy's mouth. That got edited out, but the blood splatters on the kids remained. That actually led some people to think that Jeremy shot his classmates, not himself. As Pellington himself said, quote, Probably the greatest frustration I've ever had is that the ending is sometimes misinterpreted as that he shot his classmates. The idea is that his blood on them and they're frozen at the moment of looking, end quote. There was also an edit made to the classroom Pledge of Allegiance scene, as some people thought that the salute that was given during that scene might actually be mistaken for a Nazi salute. There was also the usual, quote, let's blame music videos and music in general for the world's problems, end quote. Case in point, 
after a school shooting at Frontier Lake Junior High School in Moses Lake, Washington, that left three people dead, prosecutors tried to say that the shooter was influenced by the Jeremy video. Go figure. The music video went on to win four MTV Music Video Awards, including Video of the Year. When the band accepted the Video of the Year Award on stage, they brought Trevor Wilson with them. Eddie then went on to say, quote, No, um, I mean, I guess you gotta say thanks. No, the real shit is, if it weren't for music, I think I would have shot myself in front of the classroom, you know? It really is what kept me alive. So this is kind of full circle. So, to the power of music, thanks. End quote. Then he handed the award to Trevor as they walked off stage. I have known people in my life who decided that their pain was too great and they needed to check out. You may be someone or know someone who feels the same way. If you are or if you know someone, there's help. Lots of it. Please reach out and call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. There's also many other resources, especially online, if you don't want to physically talk to someone. And we will put as many of those resources as we can find in the show notes. Jeremy spoke in class today. The now iconic music video for Pearl Jam's amazing hit song, Jeremy, appeared on MTV on August 1st, 1992. Apologies for the voice quivering and almost crying at the end of the Jeremy segment. I was thinking about some people at that point. And the video is actually very poignant to what they were dealing with. Anyway, let us move on. I was going to do a personal birthday greeting this week, but for yet another week, there are some other important issues to cover. So, with that being said, we are at least going to give some huge birthday shout outs to two of the 20th century's most iconic entertainers, of course, the legendary Mr. Tony Bennett, and also the iconic entertainer Mr. Louis Armstrong. Also celebrating birthdays, Fatboy Slim, a.k.a. Norman Cook of the band The House Martins, Jerry Garcia of The Grateful Dead, the composer of the American National Anthem, Mr. Francis Scott Key, Adam Yauch of The Beastie Boys, and Jerry Hollowell, a.k.a. Ginger Spice of the Spice Girls. So, happy birthday, some of those heavenly, to all of those. The band Rush is, along with Yes, one of the most influential progressive rock groups of all time. Started in 1968 at Willowdale, Toronto, Ontario, the original lineup was guitarist Alex Lifeson, singer and bassist Jeff Jones, and drummer John Rutsey. After a couple of weeks, Jones was replaced by Alex's classmate, Getty Lee. Even though they added and subtracted a couple more people, this was the lineup that they went with by 1971. As for the band's name, they came up with it courtesy of John Rutsey's brother. The group played in Toronto, gained a following, and in 1973, they released a single, which went absolutely nowhere and didn't lead to a record deal. At that point, Rush decided to do what, at that time, was considered still a pretty novel way of doing business. They said screw the record labels, and they created their own record label called Moon Records. In 1974, they released their debut album, simply called Rush, and released their first single off of it, Working Man. At first, the song seemed destined to go nowhere. But then, a radio station in working-class city, Cleveland, Ohio, started playing it because of its lyrics about pride of the working man. The song took off after that. And right after the success of Working Man, J. 
John Rutsey developed health problems concerning diabetes. Plus, he was never really a fan of touring to begin with, so he left the group. Getty and Alex decided to go the audition route to find their drummer, and they found one of the greatest drummers of all time, said by both critics and other drummers alike, Mr. Neil Peart. The partnership would last a lifetime. Neil did the majority of the lyrics, while Getty and Alex took care of the musical part. At first, they started out as a rock band. In 1977, they went into progressive rock with albums like A Farewell to Kings and Hemispheres. Moving Pictures, Permanent Waves, Signals, Grace Under Pressure, Power Windows, and Hold Your Fire came along as well. They had hit singles like Closer to the Heart, Tom Sawyer, Big Money, Limelight, Show Don't Tell, Stick It Out, Time Stand Still, and many more. The group lasted until August 1st, 2015. On that day, they played their last show at the Los Angeles Forum in Los Angeles, California. The only people who knew that this was going to be the final show was the band. They did two sets and played 26 songs in total. They started with a taped intro of The World Is, The World Is, then went into The Anarchist. 26 songs later, they finished with Working Man with an intro of Garden Road, and then they did a taped outro, Exit Stage Left. When they were done playing, Neil Peart did something that he never did in any other concert. He came out from behind his drum kit and took in the applause with the rest of the band. Unbeknownst to everyone else, Neil had started his fight with brain cancer and wanted to spend what time he had left with his family. He actually had to be convinced by the other guys to do this final tour. The band unofficially broke up in 2018. On January 7, 2020, Neil Peart passed away from brain cancer at the age of 67. Rush's final concert with the lineup of Getty Lee, Alex Lifeson, and their legendary drummer Neil Peart at the Los Angeles Forum in Inglewood, California on August 1st, 2015. This next story weaves in a little hip-hop, but not in the way you might think. Back around 2011 or so, Lin-Manuel Miranda was coming off of a very successful production that he created called In the Heights. The show had gone on to be nominated for 13 Tony Awards, winning four of them. Of course, when faced with such a greatly successful Broadway show, you kind of left wondering, how are you possibly going to top that? When Lynn manuel was going on vacation, he picked up a biography in the airport that was written by Ron Chernow called Alexander Hamilton, because why wouldn't you read something like that on your vacation, I guess? I don't know, I could think of a thousand other things to do on vacation. Anyway... For some reason, known only to creatives like us whose brains work like this, after reading a few chapters, he started picturing Hamilton's life as a musical, and he would give the play and the music a hip-hop soundtrack because, seriously, I mean, who wouldn't? Right around that time, then-President Barack Obama was doing an evening of poetry at the White House. He invited Lynn Manuel to perform parts of In the Heights. Lynn Manuel decided instead to road test parts of his Hamilton project because who wouldn't want to try something so brand spanking new in front of the President of the United States and a national audience? I mean, no pressure, right? Turns out his gamble paid off. The response was overwhelmingly positive, so much so that he decided to continue with the project and flush it out some more. In 2013, he did a workshop where he had most of Hamilton worked out by then. That went pretty well, so he finished the musical and started its off-Broadway run. He then moved the musical to Broadway, where it ran in previews for what seemed like forever, drawing huge word of mouth. Finally. On August 6th, 
15 after taking in almost $30 million in ticket sales during the preview, Hamilton officially opened on Broadway. To say that the response was positive would be the understatement of the century. Hamilton broke box office records and has sold out so many performances that even with Lin-Manuel and the original cast gone, I still don't think you can get a ticket to the show. It also tied the record for the most Tony Award wins. As far as its effect on pop culture and history goes, Hamilton actually did a lot. First, it helped to introduce a couple of generations to a lesser-known member of the Founding Fathers. It also made him so popular that when it came time to redesign the $10 bill, Hamilton was left on it. Next, it helped to expand hip-hop to the Broadway audience. And Hamilton, the musical, and the phenomenon officially premiered on Broadway on August 6th, 2015. And that is it for the Music History In-Depth Podcast for July 31st to August 6th. Thanks for listening and watching. <laughs>